Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Quadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we're delighted to welcome Carl Pillimer, who's a sociologist and gerontologist. He's professor of human development at Cornell University and of gerontology and medicine at Wild Cornell Medicine. Carl, welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. And we're delighted to welcome Leslie Wharton, who is 72-year-old retired attorney and leader of the grassroots organization Elders Climate Action. Leslie, welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. Thank you. I look forward to our conversation. And we're delighted to welcome Ruth McDermott-Levy, who is professor in the College of Nursing at Villanova University and co-director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. Ruth, welcome to Jerry Powell. Thank you. It's good to be here. So we're going to be talking about aging and climate change. But before we go into that, we always ask for a song request. Who does a song request for Alex? That's Ruth. Ruth, you got a song request? Yeah, I would like to hear It's the End of the World as We Know It. I'm going to ask, why did you pick this song? (laughs) Are you you a a nihilist? Are we doomed, Ruth? (laughs) Well, you know, when you get into the, the climate change literature, it would seem we are. But uh, believe it or not, I am an optimist, and I also believe in in the capacity of human ingenuity. So I think we can work our way out of this, but we have a lot of work to do. And I love this song. I mean, I absolutely (laughs) love this song. This takes me back to high school. There's this uh, high school band that used to play this song called Dog Odd, and uh, we used to dance to it in the high school cafeteria, the high school parties at night. Love this song. So thank you for the opportunity to sing this one. See if I get these tongue twister lyrics correct. (laughs) That's great. It starts with an earthquake. Birds and snakes and airplanes. Lenny Bruce is not afraid. Here we go. Eye of a hurricane, listen to yourself, churn world, serves its own needs, don't misserve your own needs, speed it up a notch, speed grunt, no strength, the ladder starts to clatter with a fear, height down, height wire in a fire, represent the seven games and a government for hire and a combat site, left her wasn't coming in a hurry with the furries breathing down your neck. Team by team reporters baffle Trump, Tether Croft, and look at that low plane, fine. Then, uh-oh, overflow, population, common group, but it'll do. Save yourself, serve yourself, world serves its own needs. Listen to your heartbeat, tell me with the rapture and the reverend in the right, right. You vitriolic, patriotic, slam fight, bright light, feeling pretty psyched. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Alex was going to take the whole podcast just singing that song. <laughs> he does have, at the end, <laughs> yeah. great job try to, to make it all the way through without stopping. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ruth, thanks for the song request. Maybe we can dive into this topic around aging and climate change. When we think about this, are we already seeing the effects in older adults on climate change? And what are those health effects? The answer is yes, we are already seeing effects. And, you know, they're, they're pretty much every body system. When we think about um, the older adult who has, most older adults have pre-existing conditions or comorbidities. And so any uh, additional stressors such as heat or an extreme weather event, or having to move from your home because of a climate-related disaster um, can really tax an older adult whose kind of window of resilience is more limited. You know, as we age, our our body's capacity to adapt to things becomes a little more um, challenged. And so, you know, we do see hospital admissions for um, heat exposure and certainly um, cardiovascular and respiratory um, problems related to air pollution with climate change, um, and 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 also cognitive problems. Um, you know, because of the challenge of of those stressors, we can get you know people with some confusion and and delirium and those sort of issues can also be a problem. So it really affects everything. Yeah, and I'm just thinking. I mean, I read some stuff around climate related disasters in older adults, including. 
I didn't know this before, but in Katrina, 75% of deaths were in people older the age of 60, despite them only comp- making up about 15% of the total population. Big heat waves in England in 2020, 2,224 excess deaths in the O's over the age of 65. And of these, about half were in those of older than age of 85, which mm. was huge. Right. And they accounted for older adults, 88% of all excess deaths from the heat wave. Right, right. Sort of a follow-up question for Ruth and for you on that, because if you look at the heat waves in Texas, as far as I can tell, the recent ones, 100% of people who died were over the age of 60. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Ruth, I was wondering too, and you invited us to ask each other questions, so by golly, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I, mean, I actually wonder, though, since we're on a Jerry Pal broadcast, if if a lot, I think that people are under emphasizing the special risk of older people. So if you look at government websites about heat, for example, it's got a line of buttons across the top with affected populations, outdoor workers, athletes, and older people are in there. But uh, this feels to me much more like COVID, where the most extreme effects of these climate change events and disasters and heat really are going to be the older population that we have a fundamentally and a legitimately geriatric problem in terms of um, um, vulnerability. And I sort of feel like that's downplayed, you know, how much more at risk older people are based on what Eric has just said. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, you know, and you're liking it to COVID, some of the same vulnerabilities, right? So certainly aging, pre-existing conditions or comorbidities, and then also lower socioeconomic groups. So you know, our elders who are um, people of color, people who live in places that are already um, challenged by, you know, poor air quality and those things and access to health care, you know, they also have greater risk. So um, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I also do work with children. So there's risk there. But and that's uh, Eric mentioned about, you know, excess death. The people that succumb to this are our older adults, and and we, mm-hmm. you know, we don't want to lose them earlier than we need to. Um, so it is an issue that we all need to take care of. And and then I'm I'm looking at Leslie, wondering, you know, with your organization, are there are there things that you're doing to help bridge that gap? Well, yes, thank you, Ruth. Um, Elders Climate Action, and let me just tell you a little bit about who we are, uh, was created in 2014 uh, as the project of a 501c3 uh, Elders Action Network. And we have gone from 250 members at the end of 2015 to about 26,000 right now across the United mm-hmm. States. Uh, and a number of chapters that have grown. Our focus is on advocating on policy at the national, state, local level, educating on ways to mitigate, um, you know, going all electric, uh, getting heat pumps, things like that. And obviously the health impacts are are one of the ways that we reach out to our membership to engage them. Not so much, I would say, because of their concern about the impacts on them, but our mission is to create a livable planet for our children and grandchildren and all life. And you've got us who are in our later years looking down and asking ourselves, what have we left to those people, you know, to our children, to the to the kids who are four years old now? What are they going to grow up into? And so the health impacts is is a very important part of our messaging. You know, yeah. sticking with that for a moment, um, Leslie, uh, well, Carl, tying back into your work, you you have this wonderful website that uh, I want to invite to, you to talk about aging and climate change clearinghouse. And on that, I found a link to this uh, article by Rick Moody saying that Mm -hmm. called Elders in Climate Change, No Excuses, um, in which he argues that elders are the group that benefited most from the massive consumption of fossil fuels in the post-World War II eras. And that was a time of um, burgeoning wealth for today's elders. 
and that they bear a moral responsibility because they will not reap the burdens and harms to the greatest extent. It will be future generations. We just talked about how you know, current generations of older adults are vulnerable to it, but in future, it's going to be worse. And it won't primarily be in the U.S., right? It'll primarily be in low-lying areas, in countries that have um, less wealth and are less developed than the U.S., Thoughts about that? Is that a motivating factor, um, uh, Leslie, for, for your organization? Well, let's put it this way. I do not find, as, as a former lawyer and, and other things, I do not find that forcing guilt on people is a good way to motivate them to take action. Are we responsible? Well, we grew up as children in the 50s and 60s. This was the world around us. It was a given. You know, uh, the vast economic expansion, the use of fossil fuels, uh, we didn't know no better. Um, yes, looking back, now we can see the, the effects of that world. And so we have a responsibility now that we realize to do everything that we can. But I think that responsibility should be out of love and concern for existing youth and future generations than out of slap you guilt because I benefited. Yeah, no, we lived in a, a wonderful, a wonderful time of economic growth and expansion, but it had a lot of secondary impacts that we were unaware of. And and now now we're seeing it. If I, I get it, I think that really comes into the core of the issue because I think we're touching on what strike me as the three main areas in this issue, and, and by the way, I bet that Ruth and Leslie and I have all had the same experience of giving talks to groups and people come up afterwards and say, oh, I never thought about that connection between aging and climate change as if it were something unusual to be talking about. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe all of us are touching on three areas that strike me as important. I mean, one is older people as vulnerable. And the only exception I might make is we know from environmental communication in general that public health messages are often more effective than like some of the more like love your you know mother earth kind of messages. So I think that's an important one. Uh, but we also need to look at older people as contributors to climate change. Older people in, in my parents' generation we're much more likely to be natural um, reusers and recyclers that traveled less. Uh, with the aging of the baby boom, but we're I can't say they, I will say we are contributing much more. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally is what um, Leslie was talking about is older people as agents of change. And the other piece, which, which I think your question touches on, there have been studies. One thing that keeps older some older people out of this is there are a lot of ageist messages in the climate change movement, uh, that old people don't care about us, you know, that this is a young person's movement. And that really needs to be addressed as well to get older people to mobilize as they are doing. I just wanted to pick up on 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 Carl's comment about the ageist, ageist attacks, uh, you know, the hay boomers. Uh, attacks of the youth and elders climate action decided that, yeah, we would be the boomers. You know, we, we picked that mantle up right away and say, yeah, we're the boomers and we're right, we're working with you and we're right behind you. So, uh, stop, stop hey boomers is being a, a negative, uh, bad you and more like, okay, we're with you. Oh, no, I was just going to say that's like, a, um, reclaiming or uh, uh, appropriating the term boomer and sort of re reinventing it in a positive sense rather than a pejorative sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Ruth, right. go ahead. But to touch on, you know, the elder as being responsible or, or that, you know, we benefited from fossil fuel use and all, it, it was hidden from, from us or, or people older than myself. You know, I mean, there's evidence that the fossil fuel industry knew this was a problem and hid it. So I I think we do need to move away from blame. And, and I am a public health person and I do know those messages don't work. You know, smoking is bad for you. There's other ways to be able to get those messages through. Um, but I do, I think it is really valuable, that link between health and climate. Um, because every, you know, we all breathe, we all drink water, we all... So it, it does get people's attention. It's interesting that in uh, two years ago in uh, 
Glasgow, Scotland, I guess it was COP26, that was the first time that WHO had a pavilion at Mm. at, uh, the COP meetings. And it took Mm -hmm. 26 COPs for them to be able to, and that's the the UN Climate Change Meeting uh, Committee of the Parties. It took that long for acknowledgement of, you know, a major health organization. So, um, you know, we all need to kind of get up to speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I do wonder how we get geriatrics to to care, because I I think it's no exaggeration that this is the greatest public health threat to older people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, of our... Why? Why is this the greatest health threat to older adults? Do you want to go? Because of what we've just said, because of, you know, the um, the weather related changes, increases in air pollution because of wildfires and heat domes. So there's so many public health threats that this is bringing about increase in vector borne diseases yeah. to which older people are um, especially vulnerable. The fact that, that older people have moved to the most climate sensitive regions of the country and evacuating them, especially if they have impairments, is often extremely difficult. And as you've mentioned, for people in the developing world, older people, what studies show after these disasters, older people and especially minority older people are the least likely to be able to move um, or leave. So I think we also have to start talking about how do we make older people climate change resilient? You know, what do we do to very concretely, you know, provide heat shelters and 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 the cool shelters. I, so it's hard to know about individual practice when I think of geriatrics um, or geriatric nursing, because a lot of the solutions are really broad scale public health initiatives are needed, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. And you know, Eric, to answer your question also, it affects every aspect of our life, right? So, you know, the things that Carl mentioned, but also, you know, uh, access to health care during a disaster or even heat. I mean, there's days, you know, my, my mother passed away a year ago, but prior to that, there were days when it was so hot or the air quality was so poor in suburban Philadelphia, I couldn't take her outside. And she a, was a relatively healthy woman. And it is going to affect, if it hasn't already, our food quality, the food that's available, our medications, uh, you know, there, there's an issue with Um, In extreme heat, the medications may lose its efficacy. And there's certain medications that make someone more vulnerable to heat. And And the power outages that we see. Right, right. And so, again, as we age, we do rely on more stuff, right, to keep us healthy and to keep us active, whether it be, you know, home oxygen or, or a suction machine or medications. I mean, many people in their, you know, mid to older years are on certain medications. And so, and then access to those we saw during Katrina, you know, we couldn't get IV fluids. So every single part of our life is affected and mental health issues. I guess, Ruth, the question for you is, what's the role of the healthcare system in all of this? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Why is it up to the healthcare system? Yeah. So, okay. So if you're talking about the system itself. Yeah. Um, that is a big emitter of greenhouse gases. I think it's the second emitter. It's like 90% of, of all greenhouse gases come from the healthcare sector, I think. Is yes. Wait, right? one yes. percent? Say oh. it again. Nine percent. Nine percent. We're second to the restaurant. Carbon industry. emissions come from healthcare. Yep. Yes. So there are initiatives to green our healthcare system and reduce its carbon footprint. And actually, um, actually, at COP26 in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, uh, there was an initiative, um, an international initiative put forth by Healthcare Without Harm, which, uh, by the way, was founded by a nurse and a physician um, in the United States. Um, but they, the United States signed on to it at that point. And so there is a push from the Department of Health and Human Services to get um, all healthcare systems on board to reduce carbon emissions. Well, There's a variety of ways to do It doesn't feel like that. we've done that because the amount of waste that yes. we see in all- Right, mm-hmm. right. And so, right. So there's waste, there's, you know, the energy that's used, it's the food, it's, there's, you know, it's a, it's there a whole. Was, I, the, just an article, I think it was in JAMA, New England Journal on uh, the impact of clinical trials on right. global warming. And suggestions and, on how to decrease that impact or at least include that impact. 
right. when we're writing for grants and publishing. And and then to answer your question also about, you know, the different providers as far as nurses and physicians and respiratory therapists and pharmacists, um, most schools of medicine, nursing, and all those other fields are um, including some climate change in their uh, curriculum. It, for nursing education, it is now a requirement for accreditation. Really? So that's a big win. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. For um, yeah, it's really good. And then for medical education, I know they are they are doing a lot as well. Um, they are trying to get it into their um, licensing exam. Nursing's had a problem getting it there, and we may get there t- at some point. But medicine is working on that. And there's an organization called Global Consortium for Climate and Health Education that is really leading the way for all healthcare providers for information on how to do that. So as we start talking about things that we can do about it, maybe we can just start off with this this thing of, you know, including it in the curriculum for healthcare professionals. Ruth, you're involved in including it in the nursing curriculum. What does that actually look like? Again, I'm an optimist. I don't see it as that hard. You know, I mean, really, because if we're talking, if we're teaching somebody about respiratory disease, then we can add, well, on, you know, we need to check the air quality and what does that mean? And, 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 you know, there's so many great tools to do that. One is air now from the EPA that you can have on your smartphone. And that's a good thing to share with an older patient or client that, you know, to be making decisions about your activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you can, you can just get it in there. I think it's important to teach students you know, all healthcare students and probably all students, what climate change is and how we got to this point. But then after that, as far as the health piece, uh, you can just infuse it into whatever body system you're talking about or whoever, you know, however you're teaching that. So it, it's not that difficult. Yeah, you know, I think it's also just spinning off what Ruth said there. There is this interconnection between aging and climate change and more generally older people and disasters. Mm-hmm. And so if we think of, of that relationship, though, as these kinds of disasters increasing, so flooding, hurricanes, extreme heat and extreme cold, there are system level things to do. Like one really promising thing, and Ruth, you, you may know more about this, but uh, in the VA system, in some of the regional VAs, they have great now um, plans you know, to make sure that everybody who's, who's on a medical device that, that requires electricity is kept track of. Uh, because in some of these disasters, people, as has been noted, die the, because of, there's no electricity to power um, or whatever it is they need to make sure that they can get um, medications. So different kinds of networking, uh, cell phone reminders, ability to keep in touch of very vulnerable older people is something that's less on the practice level, but is really important on the health systems level. And I think really the VA is kind of pioneering some of that. And I think other people could use it as well. How about, um, Leslie, what are you encouraging hearing from your members, uh, older adults to do to combat climate change? What we're doing is we're offering a home, a platform for folks who haven't retired yet or are retired. Um, I got involved five years before I retired, but a a place for purpose, because a lot of the problems for elders is they step out of the structured work environment where they were part of a pyramid structure. They had their colleagues, they had their instructions, they knew what to do. And the old myth that, oh, you're now you're going to get an extended vacation and play golf and pinochle or something Well, that lasts for a very short period of time before elders can start really finding themselves at loose ends. And in the old days, the elders lived in the communities they grew up with. Their kids were there. The grandkids were there. It was all part of their ecosystem. But now, you know, one kid's off this side of the planet, the other one's over there, this one's here. And and the elders are not part of a family community, what is more even a community, locale community. So what we have been doing is offering elders, you know, and we've got, we got members up into their eighties and early nineties, the opportunity to learn, to take action, engage locally, 
build chapters, be part of chapters where there is either in person or with COVID on Zoom. But here, here are the folks in your, in your county and engage. And there are so many things that can be done to address climate change. A lot of them are, you know, obviously adopting the right policies, implementing the policies, things at the individual level. The Inflation Reduction Act provides enormous tax benefits to people who get heat pumps or put solar on their roofs. And a lot of people don't know about it because it's sort of distant, out there, complex. But by educating folks, they can actually invest in things they couldn't, maybe couldn't afford on their own, but with the rebates and other things they can get, reducing, one, their costs, because these are much more efficient, two, reducing greenhouse gas pollution so that they're contributing in that way, three, being a model to the neighbors who look and say, oh, you got solar panels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do it. Or, oh, yeah, I got a heat pump and it really works well and it's much more efficient, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, we're sort of a universe of elders who've come together as volunteers who bring our backgrounds, our interests, and coalesce and we form committees. I don't want to. I don't want to take away the mm-hmm. whole show. I could do that, but um, well, well but, I wonder, Leslie, yeah. how much of the emphasis is on? You said policies up front, and making sure they're implemented. How much of the emphasis is on political action? Because in order to individual change, will only take us so far, and that what we really need is big, systematic change within the U.S. and globally. Um, somebody mentioned it's the first day of the global climate. Summit as we're recording. Cop, this. Cop, Cop 28. Yeah. Cop 28. The, and, the- and so how much of your organization is focused on that political action or do you steer clear of it because well, it's a little well, bit of a sensitive topic in some places and there's some pushback? Let, let me, I don't want to use the word correct, but that's the one coming to mind, your language, yeah. right? Please. Because it's not political. That is, we're not, we're not partisan. It is not, oh, yes, Democrats or, oh, yes, Republicans. Legislation, regulatory actions, those are things that, that don't have to be political in the sense of, you know, parties. We're a 501c3, a nonprofit. We can't engage in political action, hmm. but we can certainly do letters to members of Congress, uh, appear at, I mean, I have appeared at virtual environmental protection agency rulemaking meetings and testified over Zoom, or I could go in person. Um, so we're, we really are focused on the policies and the implementation that are needed to be adopted to move us from spouting greenhouse gases to reducing them and to a sustainable world that that can support the kind of lifestyle that, you know, we grew up with, albeit one creating uh, world devastating pollution. So yeah, we're, we're very focused on that, but you know, part of that is also educating our members and educating people on what they can do and helping bring them together into virtual communities or forming local communities. And, you know, health is not my area of focus, but for elder people, for those in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and who are retired and who may be in their apartments, condos, and homes, this is enormous mental health benefit. To feel that you are you are engaged with others on something positive, that mm. you are shoring each other up when the when the climate depression strikes, you're in a conversation with your elder friends who helps mitigate social isolation too. Mitigate social isolation gives, you, isolation, gives yeah. you something to you know to engage with with others outside. Uh, so it is an enormous mental, physical health benefit, because we feel we're still part of the world and we're making a difference and we are learning and we're engaged. And, you know, when I was born, people didn't live past their six, you know, 60s. And now it's like you keep seeing the obits, 103 years old, 104 years old. Mm -hmm. So the point is we're crafting a new way of being. There's a, if I could insert a little research nugget, 
There, um, we and others have done research showing that we know that, that volunteering is very good for older people and that they volunteer in large numbers. Yep. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only around 1% of older people have environmental volunteerism as their main role. However, volunteering in environmental activities turns out to be even better than other kinds of volunteering. It involves nature exposure. It allows older people to express generativity, sort of a building a world that they won't live to see. So it's kind of win-win-win if we could move the vast numbers of baby boomers more into this area. It's not just Leslie saying people's impressions. There's good research showing that uh, activities around environmental sustainability and conservation that'd be good to prescribe to your patients, you know. <laughs> and it, you know, and I really think we don't have research on it, but we certainly know that at the end of life, nature exposure is really positive, um, as is a sense of purpose. So I would think there might even be, you know, like in more sort of towards the end of life intervention you know, in there somewhere to get people engaged in these kinds of generative environmental activities. Great. I also wonder, because I'm hearing, you know, from Leslie, like there's an individual focus, there's a focus on the policies out there. I, I wonder if we can focus again on the 10% that the healthcare sector is, is contributing to uh, carbon emissions in the U.S. What's our role in changing the healthcare system? Not like in, like in our own healthcare system, like we're that we're that kind of that middle area where, you know, whether it be our clinics in the operating rooms, you are talking about a network of corporations, of manufacturers, of suppliers, of scientific research groups. I mean, you are talking about a huge, huge network. So. I, I can't speak to how you can start insinuating yourself into that process to get change, but a lot of it would come from regulatory work, from pressure to reduce plastics, to reduce, you know, a mish that, that is to find ways of producing the things that are being produced now and getting them around to the people who need them at lower climate cost. Well, well I mean, but, I'm, but I'm also just thinking about, you know, we talked about COVID there's one thing I saw with COVID is the amount of waste we produced increased dramatically. And I'm, I'm wondering from like you, Ruth, like, well, is yeah, this part so, of your curriculum is like leadership, like in your own institution, do we just, these one-off things that we just throw away every, every time no. we use it or is the, like, how do well, we no. teach nurses and doctors to actually pay attention when we're thinking about creating policies to maybe so, include impact on global warming and climate. There's, there's a lot of things that are coming up here. So I'm going to back up because I'm a public health person. What we need to do as a nation <laughs> is be more preventative, right? And so that, you know, if we walk more, we ride bikes to places and things like that, we're not creating the emissions and we're becoming healthier and we're, our mental health is better and we lose weight and all of those great things. And so we do have a life a longer life. And so that's one thing, you know, better food, all of that kind of stuff we need to really concentrate on as a nation because we don't do good, do very well in that department. The other thing is as far as the health system, yes, I totally agree that we need policies, but you know, we're talking about 50 states and what a mess that's going to be with states' rights. But there's opportunity for the health system to save money. If they don't generate as much waste, because healthcare waste is really expensive, it goes into a whole bunch of different uh, categories, they can save a lot of money. And actually, we worked with a hospital um, on a project like that to demonstrate, you know, we don't need to wear gloves for every time we touch a patient. We really do not. Um, and so we need to get away from some of that craziness in, in our system. And, and my mother was a nurse <laughs> back in the day when, you know, they reused and sterilized things. And, and so we don't need to waste as much. I was just in Kenya uh, visiting hospitals. And, and one of the things they did in, in ICU and in, in the surgical units, you, they wear these little footy things. They're paper things to cover your feet so you don't track in uh, bacteria and other pathogens. They take their shoes off and wear Crocs that stay in there. And then they're just washed. So again, it, it was like a brilliant thing. And, and so we, we, we can learn from our colleagues in the developing world. So we, we really do need to think about what we're doing. 
Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I think that we forget, though, too, is that, you know, healthcare is is 20 percent of our gross domestic product. So it is the polluting in the same way others do. I, I, Ruth, I wonder if you agree. I think there's been some helpful movement in this area. The Joint Commission either was going to or did uh, offer new accreditation standards addressing climate impacts. And, uh, you know, I think they're also they're trying to revise national construction and safety codes for hospitals mm-hmm. that will make them more environmentally efficient. I think a lot of things are still voluntary, which, of course, uh, means that a lot of people won't comply. But I feel like slowly the healthcare industry is addressing the degree to which it has this enormous uh, impact. And the Biden administration slowly also seems to be trying to move some of these things forward. I'm just not sure where they stand now, but they're all good ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rachel Levine has been a real advocate of that, too, in, in HHS. So, yeah, we we do have federal advocates. And then, you know, as they mentioned, Healthcare Without Harm, and then there's also Practice Green Health, which are organizations that are trying to do that. And you know, our elders rely on, you know, those services. So we want to have good services, but we, we want to keep them out of the hospital too and, and you mm-hmm. know, have a healthy lifestyle for them and everyone else. Mm-hmm. I just want to say that the National yeah. Academy of Medicine has an action collaborative on decarbonizing the U.S. health sector. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would be an interesting thing for people to take a look at if they're concerned about this. No, that's great. And it, it ties into what I was going to say. I was in the East Coast last spring. We were college touring because my older son's like senior in high school this year and every college we went to had a big banner net carbon neutral by and they all had a different date you know 2030 2045 whatever it was they took pride in it they know their students care about it Mm -hmm. and there's that their applicants want to go to a school that cares deeply about it wouldn't it be great if our hospitals and healthcare systems also had that same sort of incentive? And we are people who work in those systems, and we can encourage our systems to move in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's another opportunity, again, for older adults to engage with their grandchildren who are, you know, high school and college age that are really interested in it. So, it, again, you know, thinking of the work Leslie does. I wanted to also say, um, Rick Moody has this wonderful quote from the Talmud at the end of his article. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And uh, again, I found that from uh, Carl's site, Aging and Climate Change Clearinghouse. Carl, do you want to say more about that site? I know it was relatively recently launched and what your hopes are for it. I'm um, sure, yeah, we're, we're uh, um, very excited about that. And we've tried to make there be something in it uh, for everybody. Its major goal is to try to pull together information on aging and climate change for three groups. One is researchers, so folks who might want to do work in this. Many of us who work in the field in social science and climate change were doing something else before. Uh, and in other fields, it's you know we've sort of seen it as moving our personal interests and agenda into our work. And so there are a lot of resources for them. Uh, There's a searchable database on aging and climate change that's kept up to date, annotated bibliographies. And then there's also information that links older people themselves to possible opportunities uh, and one for environmental organizations. And I'll say one thing, and I'm not sure if Leslie has a thought. When we were starting this work, we surveyed local environmental organizations and found that they aren't particularly elder friendly. Very few modify activities so people with some level of disability might be able to do them. And they don't specifically try to attract these 75 million boomers who are a huge resource. So we also try to provide guidance for them as well, how they can attract older volunteers, how they can work with them. So uh, we would love people to come here. Aging and climate change, um, a clearinghouse. So we finally have enough hits that uh, it comes up on a Google search. And I wanted to say, I hope your uh, son, is it, is considering Cornell. (laughs) (laughs) Or Villanova. (laughs) Very small liberal arts colleges only. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But yeah, thanks a lot. And we really uh, hope it's a good vehicle for the for the kind of work that uh, you know all of us are doing
Sure. I wonder, I'll, you know, I, I want to be mindful of the time. We're running close to the, to the hour. Um, we're going to have links to all these sites on our show notes. I wonder if I can hear from each of you, like, let's go to the brass taxi, like the people who are listening to this podcast, hopefully you've convinced them that this is an important issue that they should also take up. What are you hoping that they do after listening to this podcast? Carl, how about I want to start with you? I, I hope they'll be aware of it. I hope they'll prioritize it. I hope they'll educate themselves. I also hope that everybody involved, and since we're talking maybe to more sort of medical and health professionals, that they keep two things in mind. One is we still need to do everything we can do to prevent the effects of climate change. But for your sake, for the sake of your practice, those are your patients, you have to think about mitigation and resilience. So how are your patients going to deal with extreme heat and cold? How are they going to deal with, with power failures or um, increasing air pollution? You know, I think that we need a sort of a climate change lens. And it's like staring at the sun. It's easier for everybody not to think about it. But I think it's really critical to both be involved in reducing the sources of climate change in your healthcare setting or, or practice, but also be really thinking about how your vulnerable patients are going to be affected by these changes. Wonderful. How about you, Ruth? Yeah, I agree with what Carl said. I also, you know, it, it can be really overwhelming. And, and I have some friends that actually are very intelligent and say, I can't deal with it and walk away. It's too but, big of a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but you know, I, I, I've been in this for a while, and, and you start small. And so if you're talking about, you know, healthcare providers and healthcare systems, start with waste, right? And, and do, you know, an education with people because of how to manage the waste. It's, and, and your health system will love you for it because you're going to save them money. And, and once that gets going, you know, then you can go, okay, well, let's look at our food ways. Let's look at where our food is coming from. And you can just kind of keep ticking it away. Um, there is what's it called? Project Drawdown, which has some really great evidence-based examples of how to get things done. Also, little shout out. I mean, I have some publications about how to deal with uh, discharge planning in, in the area of climate change, you know, uh, you know, kind of like really practical kind of guidelines for healthcare providers. And, and the other thing, we just did a survey with senior centers for, you know, people, healthy adults who are out in the community and their preparation for climate change adaptation, and they're not prepared either. And they're mm. not thinking about health effects. So, you know, again, for providers, that may be a place to do some outreach and, you know, trying to keep people as healthy as they can so they don't end up in the hospital. Yeah. Well, if you also send me the discharge planning paper, I'll include it in the show <laughs> notes. Um, okay. Love thinking about this. And again, it, it kind of meshes with the geriatric approach too, which includes minimizing things that don't work, whether it be like right. multi-day nighttime lab checks in the hospital or keeping people in the hospital or just avoiding the hospital um, if at all possible, de-prescribing a really important part of, of waste in the healthcare system. Leslie, right. what, what's your yeah. what's your focus? Well, I, I I think that it bridges uh, with Carl and and Ruth. Uh, obviously, we're not gerontologists; we're not dealing with the sick. But for everyone who's engaging with elder people, they are either suffering the impacts of climate change, or they're trying to uh, you know adapt to uh, to avoid them, and they're having some emotional and mental impacts, even if it's just from the news. And I think that learning about things like Elders Climate Action, Third Act, which is Bill McKibben's group of over, over 60 people, but learning about the opportunities that elders have to engage and, and make a difference. And yes, climate change is global. It's overwhelming. It's got multiple sources it, you need to you need to touch base in all these places but by engaging in organizations you can you can take a slice of the pie focus on it own it feel good about it and know that you are contributing to something and that you're you're working for your kids the grandkids grandnieces and nephews uh, 
the kids you see running down the street to go to school. So I think that engaging on climate change with others and is an is an enormous opening for elders. And I don't think doctors often think about, you know, what's your social engagement? What is your, how are you mm-hmm. finding purpose in life? You know, how many times are you just clicking the the dial on your, on your TV to see if you could find a more entertaining program? There, there are ways. And I love the idea of a bigger view of prevention too. Like we think about prevention, yeah. like colonoscopies, mammograms, like bigger bigger views of what does it mean to do prevention for older adults minimize that screening what was that's that, not prevention that's screening <laughs> <laughs> well um i i love all of this and i want to thank you all but before we end i think alex is going to give it's the end of the world one more try it's a lot of lyrics <laughs> all at once well, that's so exciting. <laughs> we're just going to do a little bit of the end here <laughs> The other night I dreamt a nice continental drifted-eyed mountain sit in a line Leonard Bernstein, Leonid Brezhnev, Lenny Bruce and Lester Banks Birthday party, cheesecake, jelly bean, boom You symbiotic, patriotic, slam butt neck Right, right, it's the end of the world as we know it It's the end of the world as we know it It's the end of the world as we know it and I feel fine Ruth Leslie Carl thanks for joining us on this podcast thank you and thank you for the amazing work that you do and thank you to all of our listeners for your continued support and we'd like to say a special thank you to those Jerry Powell listeners who've donated more than $250 including Susan Nelson Christopher Heck Lindsay Yorman Mo Rizawi, Sue Borson, Carrie Rubenstein, Marissa Galicia Castillo, Cara Bischoff, Kate Mesrich, James Tulski, Louise Aronson, Asher Edwards, Mark Apfel, Michael Bordofsky, Dwayne Dobschutz, Frisch Brandt, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens, Roseanne Leipzig, Elizabeth Chung, Amis Samoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Martin, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, Himanshu Mahotra, Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Woolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, and Bob Rixey. Thanks, everyone.